Hello and good evening. My name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Resource Center here at SOAS, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you, you all here. Very good turnout for Wednesday evening. I would also like to welcome the people who are joining us online. We have 33 people uh, so far. Um, it's a particular pleasure because we've been talking about this event um, for quite a while. Uh, we started discussions um, over a year ago, I think, and there were different iterations and different formats. But finally, we found the perfect um, match. So tonight's speaker is one of our very own, Dr. Monica Hinkle, who is a lecturer uh, in the School of Arts um, here at SOAS. Uh, she studied Japanese studies, Oriental art history, and political science at the University of Bonn and wrote her PhD thesis on the topic of the Japanese print artist Toyohara Kunichika and the influence of Bunme Kaita, the civilization and enlightenment movement on his prints. She has been widely active as a curator and indeed will talk about her curatorial work for the Dulwich Picture Gallery um, today, but she's already this year, or at the end of last year, uh, curated an exhibition at Eton, um, who unsurprisingly has a substantial collections of uh, Japanese uh, woodblock uh, prints. And so please welcome Dr. Monica Hinkle to the JRC. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fabio, for your very kind introduction and for having me tonight. And uh, well, thank you all for, for coming. It's lovely to see so many familiar uh, faces here tonight. Uh, and also welcome to everyone uh, who has joined uh, online. Thanks very much for your interest. So as Fabio already said, uh, tonight's uh, lecture is part, of course, of my research, being an expert in Japanese bootstock prints but it is connected to an exhibition that I'm currently curating at the Dulwich Picture Gallery. And it is called Yoshida, Three Generation of a Japanese uh, Printmaking. And it will run between the 19th of June and the 20th of October this year at the Dulwich Picture Gallery. And it will be the first UK exhibition actually on these printmakers, uh, the Yoshidas. So um, they have been widely exhibited in the United States, but it is the first UK exhibition, and I think I'm quite sure actually uh, the first one in uh, Europe. Of course, you need to ask yourself why the Dulwich Picture Gallery, or I first would like to introduce you to the Dulwich Picture Gallery, because maybe some of you have not uh, visited the gallery. It's actually the world's oldest public uh, gallery. Uh, here you see uh, the entrance uh, at the front and also a view uh, from uh, the back. It was founded in 1811, uh, and it houses the um, previous private collection uh, of uh, Sir Francis Bourgeois who was a royal academician, and his collection was yeah, sort of the founding collection of uh, this uh, fabulous gallery. And the architect uh, who created or designed the gallery space uh, was uh, Sir John Soane, uh, one of yeah, the leading architects uh, at the time. And Bourgeois left around 2,000 pounds uh, for John Soane to create this space. I mean, since 1811, it has seen many alterations and also uh, additions. But uh, one thing that I learned when I started the project, I became the project curator uh, last March. The top, uh, there's actually a mausoleum uh, at the top here, uh, or in the middle of the gallery space. And the top of that mausoleum served as inspiration for the design of the London Red Film Group. Um, so I, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> I thought I shared this knowledge with you tonight. I found that really quite uh, fascinating. So the gallery space uh, you see here, this is the, the permanent gallery space. And of course, it's famous 
uh, for its Rubens, its Rembrandts. So uh, a lot of really well-renowned, uh, particular European artist Van Dyck uh, is also often uh, shown there. It's a succession of various rooms through these arches, and you have this wonderful light coming in uh, from uh, these roof lanterns that really give this uh, exhibition uh, galleries uh, a beautiful atmosphere. And it also served to, yeah, quite a lot of other museums, like the Getty Museum in LA, for example, uh, as inspiration too. Coming back to my question, why Dalich, why the Yoshida family of printmakers uh, is being exhibited there? I need to start with the first generation of printmakers, and this was Yoshida Hiroshi. He and his compatriot, his friend, who also signed there the book, uh, Nakagawa Hachiro, he left Japan, those two, in 1899 on a trip to the US. Um, they were inspired by other many Meiji period artists at the time, in particular artists of yoga, Western style painting, and ventured to the States and visited a variety of cities, uh, Detroit, Boston, Washington, uh, Providence, and not only visited, uh, those cities, but also sold their watercolors or oil paintings there. So they were hugely popular in the United States. The Americans simply loved those Japanese themes. And because they also sold their artwork at those shows, they had accumulated quite a bit of money and were able to extend their trip. Uh, so in May 1900, they decided to leave New York and travel to England. So they arrived at the beginning of May, I think it was the 9th of May 1900, in Liverpool. Uh, the next day, they took a train down to London in fog. Um, I have partly written, uh, I have partly read the, the diary of Yoshida Hiroshi. Uh, and he said, yeah, it was a very uh, foggy day, but we enjoyed then later on the beautiful English countryside on their way to London. Uh, they first stayed at a house close to Euston Square and spent a few weeks in London and explored various galleries. But somehow, and I wasn't quite able to establish why, they had heard about the Dulwich Picture Gallery. They made three attempts to visit the gallery. The first attempt um, was unsuccessful because the police officer at Victoria Station told them, Dalich Picture Gallery, there is no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> so they visited other galleries. They visited the British Museum, uh, the Royal Academy, the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, Maybe I should mention Hiroshi mentions in his diary uh, as at one point he grew quite tired of just seeing portraits. So they left the fourth gallery. Uh, the second attempt uh, was also unsuccessful because it was too foggy, but eventually uh, they did make their way to the Dulwich Picture Gallery by train, by steam train, on Tuesday, the 29th uh, of May 1900. And as you see here, this is the guest or visitor's book of the gallery. And you see there, um, yeah, Hiroshi Yoshida and Hachiro Nakagawa in their signature in this visitor book. And this was for the curators uh, and the director, Jennifer Scott, at uh, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, a starting point uh, for the idea to, to showcase an exhibition on this famous family of uh, printmakers. And that for me was also a starting point when I joined them. Uh, they had already selected uh, some pieces. So most of the artworks, uh, there are almost 80 uh, prints that will be on show from June onwards. Uh, they are mostly from the Fukuoka Art Museum in Kyushu, Japan. Uh, but we also have some loans from the British Museum and the Ashmolean and also uh, some from private collections. Mm -hmm. 
when Hiroshi visited the States, sold his uh, work, he was not yet a printmaker. He was a yoga painter, a painter in Western style of watercolors and uh, oil paints. But in particular, he was a very famous watercolor artist. And these are uh, two uh, examples here on the right hand side. This is the type uh, of watercolors that he produced, uh, that he sold in the States, and uh, that made him fairly popular and already quite famous uh, back in the States. So this is how uh, yeah, he encountered uh, also then Europe uh, at the time, not as a printmaker yet, but he uh, was very much influenced by all the Western art, of course, that he encountered in the States, in museums, and also here uh, in Europe. It was only when uh, he was in uh, 1920, uh, in his 40s, when he encountered the Japanese publisher Watanabe Shibaburo. Until then, yeah, he, he worked as a painter and was only through uh, that meeting with this famous um, publisher of so called Shin Hunger Prince, New Prince. I uh, have another slide about that uh, shortly. He was the major figure who wanted to kind of reinvigorate the old Ukiyo-e style printmaking of the Edo period. So Edo period 1603 to 1868. And he started already, or we have uh, some Shin Hunger prints already during yeah. the Meiji period. But then in the 1920s, he uh, encountered Yoshida Hiroshi. And it was through that meeting that Hiroshi decided to become a printmaker and he produced designs. And what the so called Ukiyoe Quartet, what he wanted to reinvigorate, stands for is that you have four people involved in the production of uh, a woodblock. You have the publisher, and this was in this case Watanabe Shibaburo. Then you have the artist, in this case now with Yoshida Hiroshi. And he worked hand in hand together with a carver and a printer. So that is why during the Edo period called the Ukiyoe Quartet, and Watanabe wanted to uh, really re-establish that now. And that is why we have then the so-called, not just because of him, but also, of course, all the artists who were eager to have their designs published uh, by him. So here, the, these are examples from the British Museum that won't be in the exhibition. Just to give you an idea what Shin Hunger prints looked like. And the major Ukiyo-e themes were actors of Kabuki theater, beauty prints, and landscapes. Everyone knows those beautiful prints of Hokusai and Hiroshido, of course, from the Edo period, and Kawasa Hasui, and also Yoshida Hiroshi, they are often referred to as the Hiroshidas of the 20th century. But you see here with Hashiguchi Hayo and Natori Shunsen, actor prints and beauty prints were also produced in this new type of Shinhanga. What did change that most of these Shinhanga prints during the 20th century were geared to a Western audience. But this is yeah, the type of themes that we would encounter. Similar what I've mentioned at the beginning that Hiroshi was a yoga painter. We have a strand of Nihongo as well, of Japanese style painting. And we also have a binary and two strands within printmaking that existed during uh, the 20th century. And next to the Shin Hanga movement, we also have the creative print movement. So Saku Hanga movement. And you see here uh, three very important works. The one here on the left-hand side is always seen by Yamamoto Kana as a seminal work of that So Saku Hanga print movement. And the aim of that print movement was that an artist is in charge of all the steps of printmaking. He designs the print himself, he prints, 
anti uh, he carves anti autocrins uh, the work himself. So without the impact and influence of the publisher and the other craftsmen. So this was really important. But you see here we have also figurative themes and landscape themes. We have a few designs that Hiroshi produced with Yoshida, uh, with Watanabe uh, Shugaburo. But before I go into that, I would like to expand from Yoshida Hiroshi to show the six artists that will be showcased in that exhibition. So we have with Hiroshi, kind of the founder of that dynasty, but his wife, Fujio, she was one of the first leading female artists in Japan, a renowned painter and later print artist uh, herself. They had two sons, well, they had more children, but it was in particular their sons, Toshi, who took over the workshop of Hiroshi, and the second born son, Hodaka, who will also be presented in the exhibition. And Hodaka's wife, Shizuko, uh, she was even before they met and married a renowned artist herself. And we will close the exhibition with the third generation of the Yoshida family, and that is Yoshida Ayomi. And as you can see, she is um, yeah, she was born in 1958. She's still alive, uh, and she came to college last year. Uh, I met her then. More about that later. So these are the six protagonists of the Yoshida family that will be shown with their work in the Dulwich Picture Gallery. And this is the gallery space. So earlier on, the rooms that I showed you uh, with the uh, red paint, this was uh, the, the gallery space of yeah, the Rubens, the Van Dykes, the Rembrandts, and the gallery nine to six, this is the special exhibition gallery space. And in these rooms, uh, we will show the work. So the first room is dedicated to the work of Yoshida Hiroshi. Then we are moving on into the second gallery, gallery eight, uh, his wife, Fujio and Toshi will be uh, shown. In the third gallery, gallery seven, uh, his brother and his uh, wife, uh, Shizuko. And in the final space, we will have an installation, uh, a site-specific installation by Yoshida Ayumi, because she's not just a print artist, she's also uh, doing installations. And this is the uh, gallery uh, space here from the Bert Morisot exhibition that was on at the gallery last year. Uh, so yeah, we haven't quite decided yet on the color of uh, the walls yet, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, this will be the space uh, where the exhibition uh, will be in. As already said, Yoshida Hiroshi, he uh, printed or produced a few designs through the publisher and the craftsman uh, he engaged uh, for uh, the Watanabe Publishing House. Unfortunately, in 1923, the great Kanto earthquake uh, destroyed Tokyo. And the whole workshop of uh, Watanabe Shodaburo, many of the book blocks, many of the prints that he had in this uh, workshop were destroyed, and also many of Hiroshi's designs and wood blocks. That was one of the reasons why then in 1923, Hiroshi decided to go on another trip to the United States to actually sell the prints that he still had to this American audience. And this was kind of a, a kickstart then. He, he realized how popular these prints also next to having sold in earlier years his paintings. He realized how uh, popular these were among Western buyers. And upon his return uh, to Japan, uh, he opened his own print workshop in Tokyo. He worked together with, also with carvers and also with uh, printers. 
but he was very much involved in that whole system. And that is the reason why I explained to you what Shin Hanga is and what Susa, Susaku Hanga is. Because the whole Yoshida family is actually the production of that prince uh, from this stage onwards, uh, kind of a hybrid production in style and feel, very much indebted to Shin Hanga, but the whole production process, because they were thoroughly engaged with the whole process without a publisher, that is the part or the style of the Susaku Hanga artist. And uh, Yoshida Hiroshi also did carve some of his prints himself uh, and also uh, some of uh, his designs uh, he engaged as a printer. Uh, but throughout his life, uh, that he was always uh, yeah, thoroughly involved because he had uh, learned from Watanabe and also then uh, from the professional carvers and printers that he engaged in his own Yoshida workshop in uh, Tokyo. He was the first Japanese print artist who then also signed and titled his prints in English. And most of his prints also have uh, the yeah. appeal yeah. of Jibui, which means self-printed uh, in the margin. So even more so showcasing the dominance and the importance of his involvement in the print uh, production process. And I show you here, he, he was uh, a fan of the mountains. He was a mountaineer. He often went on hikes around Japan and uh, he produced in 1926 in his own uh, workshop here, this beautiful uh, print of a series of the Japanese Alps. But as I mentioned, when the earthquake uh, had happened in Tokyo 1923, he went on another trip uh, to the States and Europe uh, together with uh, Fujio. And he made a lot of uh, sketches while traveling. And these are the, really the results from uh, that trip. So you have here from 1925, uh, then produced these after his uh, return uh, in Tokyo in his workshop, the Grand Canyon, and there El Capitan. And you see here on the left hand margin, for example, of the Grand Canyon, you see the red seal of Jizuri, so self uh, printed, self. -cut. So this is really uh, hugely important to have that incorporated in his uh, work. And uh, he produced um, uh, six uh, views altogether for this United States series. But then moving on to Europe, he also produced uh, a series uh, on uh, European sites. Here we have here the Acropolis at night in Greece and also uh, a canal in Venice. What he was really intrigued by and fascinated by is the overall effect of uh, changing light on sites. <clears throat> and as I've already shown you here, I mean, here we see the Sphinx by day and by night. He really wanted to capture not just those changing conditions, but with the selection of these, of this famous site, he also is within the tradition of Edo period printmakers of the so-called theme of Meisho, famous places, famous sites. So that was another hugely important continuous theme uh, that Shinhanga artists uh, related to. So here, uh, certainly one of his most uh, iconic uh, designs from that uh, series. It belongs sometimes um, to the Europe series, but of course, yeah, it is simply part of that trip that he then commenced into uh, Egypt. But this, these views of, and the effect of different times of day, of seasons and so on, uh, he continued also with views of uh, Japanese uh, sites. In particular here, 
Itoigawa in the morning and in the evening, uh, he really played, I mean, uh, and produced them really in a quite laborious way with many, many wood blocks, of course, for each color, you would have a different wood block next to the key block, uh, the shading uh, and uh, printing areas again and again to get the subtleties uh, of the shading um, is uh, really something that gives his uh, prints quite sort of a painterly quality, uh, really absolutely uh, amazing what he was able to achieve. In 1930, he went on a trip with his uh, first son, Toshi, to, uh, to India. And he also produced here a series, uh, India and South Asia. And for many days, he spent uh, in front of the Taj Mahal uh, sketching. And in his diary, he mentions that, yeah, they were always surrounded by uh, by locals who were very curious to, to see what they were doing there and uh, simply uh, watch them uh, sketching, you know, the whole day long. But here again, he plays uh, with, yeah, these uh, different moods that he wanted to capture in the morning and also at night. And this is a really fascinating piece that will also be in the exhibition. Uh, and I will go into that uh, when I talk about Ayomi at the end. This is, for example, uh, uh, in a, uh, a woodblock print uh, that uh, he designed after a watercolor that he had already produced in 1904. Uh, this happened quite frequently as well. So not just taking the inspiration from the sketches from his travels, but also he sometimes then referred back to his watercolors that he had produced in previous years and had not sold uh, to Americans, uh, for example, or, or Japanese. So uh, here uh, he produces this really absolute uh, iconic uh, view of cherry blossom view viewing of Hanami taking place uh, particular here in Kumoi, uh, close to Yoshino, where which is one of the most iconic areas close to Nara, uh, where a lot of cherry trees uh, are and uh, has been a site for or inspiration uh, for poems and uh, paintings uh, among a variety of uh, generations of uh, Japanese artists and uh, poets. But what is also quite fascinating to pick on in the exhibition, this is more showcased and explained in the catalog because yeah, I won't be able to show uh, this print by, by Hiroshige. But what we also would like to show in the exhibition is a kind of continuity and change. Uh, there are always references, as I've already mentioned, to previous generations. Uh, of printmakers from the Edo period, like Hiroshige. So this famous view here, the bridge of Kamedo Shrine in, well, in Hiroshige's time, it was still Edo. Now, of course, uh, during uh, the Shura period, during uh, Hiroshige's time, uh, it is uh, Tokyo. So he was certainly inspired also by similar sites that during the Edo period, woodblock printmakers would also uh, refer to and depict uh, in their views, in their famous views. Let's move on to his wife, Ujio. As you can see here already with these two watercolors on the left-hand side, uh, she was also originally a watercolor painter. And as I said, she was one of the first renowned Japanese female watercolorists uh, in uh, Japan. Like Hiroshi, she was also born in Kyushu, in Fukuoka. And her uh, maiden name uh, is Inoue Ujio. And her father uh, was 
um, a teacher, but also an artist, uh, Western style uh, artist. And he did not have an heir for his workshop, and he actually adopted Hiroshi. So Fujio and Hiroshi are actually related, being step brother and sister, but they later got married. So she did start at a very early age with sketching, seeing her father, seeing others within her father's studio. Uh, but her father died uh, while she was fairly young and then she moved with her mother uh, to Tokyo uh, where Hiroshi had already moved to. She uh, became kind of, uh, yeah, well, he, he became her guardian. He introduced her to a variety of painting schools and circles where she would also then uh, practice her, her skills. And she accompanied him to trips to the States. And uh, it is really quite fascinating uh, to see uh, the various uh, photographs in, in previous catalogs. Uh, but Hiroshi died in 1950, and as you can see here from Fujio's uh, life days, she uh, died short of the 100th birthday in 1987. So this is actually a photograph of the family after Hiroshi's death. You see Fujio there in the right-hand corner. Uh, you see uh, Toshi on the left-hand side, the firstborn son, with his wife, uh, Kisu. Uh, the second-born son, Fudaka, here at the front next to Fujio, and Shizuko there in the background. So this is the, the nucleus of the Yoshida family after the death of uh, Hiroshi. But what Fujio became famous for, and after the death of uh, Hiroshi, particularly the sons ventured out from particular Hodaka straight away into abstraction, as you will see in a moment. And the work of her sons very much inspired Fujio. Uh, she had quite a plethora and diverse selection of themes that uh, she covered in her works. Uh, as you could see earlier from uh, the, the two uh, watercolors here, um, yeah, she, she ventured quite similarly as uh, Hiroshi did, uh, showcasing scenes of uh, Japan, but also made sketches on their travels to the United States and, and Europe. But the whole experiment of her sons with uh, uh, abstraction um, convinced her, and also with uh, printmaking, uh, convinced her uh, to produce uh, a set of enlarged flowers. And she had done uh, similar views of enlarged flowers in oil beforehand and took these as inspiration to create in 1953, 54, a series of these enlarged flowers. And she actually had the fishbowl that she used, where she would place the flowers inside to get uh, these um, detailed views uh, that she then uh, created here. And we know that she partly also then uh, printed these. She had done prints in, in earlier years, uh, but uh, this was after a 30 year hiatus uh, the first time that she had created uh, prints again. And these are uh, three of her most iconic um, pieces. And we will have six of these enlarged uh, flowers in the exhibition. Uh, yeah, like with Hiroshi, she also traveled then with her sons. We see her here together with Hodaka and Shizuko uh, at the Dallas Museum of Art. So they continued their strong connections with uh, museums in the United States where uh, prints by Hiroshi were already uh, in the collection. And so this uh, very much uh, continued. She was influential in the founding of the Shuyokai. Uh, this was the uh, first, um, it's the a Million Leaf Society. It's the first society for females uh, in Japan uh, that supported 
female uh, artists uh, to uh, in their work in the exhibitions and uh, she was uh, one of the founding members uh, of that uh, society and in 2004 there was a special exhibition on the Yoshida family in the states and uh, I found this really so lovely from a contemporary artist uh, Shabaro uh, an homage to uh, Fuji or Yoshida and uh, it showed her yeah at a later age but closely connecting her to her very famous enlarged uh, flower uh, pieces. And I thought I just think this will not be in our exhibition. Let's move on to Yoshida Toshi. After the sudden death of Hiroshi in 1950, he took over the Yoshida workshop. Uh, he had, of course, uh, as a child, he was born in 1911. As you can see here from an early age, he was uh, sketching, he was involved with the whole printmaking business in his father's workshop. He viewed how all the craftsmen uh, were working there, his father, how he did uh, how he did the designs, how uh, the, the printers work and the carvers as well. And of course, being the firstborn, uh, he was yeah, supposed to take over and that is what he did. Uh, the business had, of course, suffered quite severely during the war and also in the years after the war. So uh, he really pushed, he enlarged the studio and really pushed uh, the production of many of his uh, famous and popular uh, designs of uh, his father, of Hiroshi, but also his own. And this is the type of art that he produced. And you see here really the wonderful legacy and the continuity of the works uh, that his father had created. Uh, but we already sense here uh, a stronger modernity, particularly in the view here of the supper wagon and also of Shinjuku, uh, uh, which was already at the time really a very important hub uh, in, uh, in Tokyo. Similar to what his father experimented with, different times of day, different moods, uh, different seasons, different uh, weather conditions. All this uh, was also something uh, that uh, Toshi found fascinating. And in line with Edo period and other printmakers, he also produced uh, a series of a certain theme. And here we have, uh, in particular, he was fascinated with Tokyo at night. And uh, quite mesmerizing there, I think, the view from uh, the Ogaku Bridge uh, with yeah, the Sumida River here, the reflection uh, of those houses and restaurants, the lights there, but also the hustle and bustle there uh, in this tiny alley here uh, along um, the area of uh, Shinjuku. And these are two pieces that we will be showing too. I mean, earlier I showed the Kamido uh, shrine, the inspiration that Hiroshi might have had uh, from Hiroshige. Here we have the famous uh, Himeji Castle, uh, which is yeah, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, one of the most famous castles in Japan. And uh, he produced uh, this view here in 1951, which his father, had done already in 1926. But not just copying the view, but certainly giving his own inspiration, his own um, creation here. He traveled throughout Japan quite a bit, uh, and uh, he was mesmerized by uh, the dry landscape gardens of Zen temples in uh, Kyoto. He actually went, uh, he, he married Kizu, they actually went uh, kind of as a, a honeymoon, uh, as his brother did with Shizuko. Um, um, they eventually to, to Kyoto, and you see here uh, the stone garden on the left-hand side, uh, even though it doesn't say the name, it's the famous Yuanji Temple. Uh, and there on the right-hand side, the famous garden of Ken Yuji. And here he incorporates a new element, 
Usually the key block is printed in black, but this is a series uh, of white lines. So instead of the black key block, we actually see here the outlines in white instead of black. So this is really giving these views a completely different uh, appeal and a certain likeness, of course. <laughs> But as I said, when I ventured into the work of Fujio, particular of the, yeah, the death of uh, Hiroshi, who was, of course, the strong founder of that uh, family, uh, who hated abstract prints. <laughs> <laughs> he made that quite clear <clears throat> to both of his sons. Uh, that is why this becomes slightly later in uh, Tsushi's oeuvre, uh, but it becomes visible. Uh, he had already uh, been to the States and he became inspired by, by cliffs, by, by rocks uh, that he then um, created uh, in these subtle nuances of particular, uh, find it always the unknown one. He sometimes gives, gives them quite uh, strange uh, titles here from 1968. Uh, but he compares these monoliths, these cliffs, almost like the buildings he would encounter uh, in, in Tokyo. So, uh, and because he had also traveled to uh, Central uh, America, uh, he also um, incorporates sometimes sort of uh, also connecting to in indigenous culture and in the States, uh, sort of some of the patterns they uh, had viewed and encountered on these strips, as you can see here in the print uh, illusion. But he actually went on uh, a trip in the late 60s, early 70s, um, together with his uh, wife and his then two uh, children. Um, in a trailer that uh, they ha uh, hired across uh, the states. And uh, they went to Santa Fe, he went to the Monument Valley, and quite in a similar way, his father was inspired by his travels. He then also produced views uh, of these sites that he had uh, seen, uh, the people that he had met, uh, for example, they were in the Santa Fe uh, example, or here, uh, Monument Valley. And uh, this is, I think, really one of the most mesmerizing uh, works that he uh, created to really capture uh, that mood, uh, the light uh, that he must have uh, uh, seen there uh, while visiting this uh, famous, uh, uh, these famous rocks there uh, in the valley. So. He then created, he, he made sketches uh, during these trips as his father had done and produced uh, these prints in the Yoshida workshop also in Tokyo. But interestingly enough, you could already see that with those two views of Santa Fe and the Monument Valley, his phase of creating abstract works was fairly short and towards the end of his life, uh, he actually went back to creating natural, realistic views. Uh, here, San Francisco, from one of his many trips here. And I kind of compare and contrast it uh, from the 70s into the 80s, partly together with his uh, elderly mom, traveled to Africa. And he uh, took these trips as an inspiration for his not just his own prints, he then also illustrated and produced children's books on animals of, uh, of Africa, uh, really absolutely charming uh, books that he, uh, uh, that he designed and published. And uh, I find it really absolutely fascinating. In one way or the other, I think San Francisco and Camouflage resemble each other sort of uh, through the trees you can then see sort of the roofs and the skyline and uh, the mountains in the background of San Francisco. And you have to look really closely. Do you see the two tigers there among the reeds? So this is really 
um, yeah, the whole atmosphere of the heat. Uh, I mean, look at the colors that he chose. Uh, he chose for this uh, piece called Camouflage. Uh, really, absolutely amazing how he was able, yeah, to produce to design that and how yeah the carvers and printer uh, together with him were able to uh, produce this uh, piece. So this is the type uh, and the dominant work uh, that towards the end of his life. Uh, he then came back to uh, then rather sticking with uh, abstract uh, motifs. Let's move on to his brother Hodaka. Uh, he wasn't supposed to become an artist uh, because his particular father said, we have Soshi, he took over <laughs> uh, the workshop. Um, he was supposed to uh, study science. He, he did for a while, uh, but um, he always sneaked into uh, the workshop and he produced uh, designs and he started to exhibit. And in one of uh, the many exhibitions that existed in Japan for printmakers, uh, he entered a piece and his father was there to judge them. And he was surprised <laughs> that it was his son's design. And he had designed, uh, of course, an abstract print that, yeah, <laughs> a fairly abstract print, but nonetheless, it won a prize. But uh, what I wanted to show here with this uh, print by Hiroshi is uh, reflecting Hiroshi's his father's love of mountaineering because Hodaka is the name of one of the most famous mountains in Japan. And in one of his, on one of his many hiking trips, uh, he also hiked Mount Hodaka that he then already once for Watanabe Shuzaburo, but that uh, got destroyed the design, the wood blocks of that uh, first design of the mountain. He produced it again for the 12 views of the Alps. Uh, in 1926, he produced it again in particular because that was the year Hodaka was born. So it was really uh, yeah, celebrating uh, the birth of his uh, second son, naming him and also then producing his print. As I said, in the year uh, Hodaka and Shizuko got married, they ventured out on their honeymoon to Kyoto and uh, Nara. And for those of you who have uh, traveled to these two cities and visited the many temples there. That's exactly what Hodaka and Shizuko did. And this is then the type of interpretation that he created in his abstract prints. He was thoroughly impacted by Western art uh, through magazines, but also through travels to the States. And this becomes really right from the start apparent. He didn't want to uh, create uh, works in the style of his father and his uh, brother. He really broke completely with the Yoshida uh, tradition. And this is the type uh, of work that he creates. Here, Konin uh, Buddhist figures relating to a ninth century uh, period in uh, Japan, uh, producing these abstract versions of wooden temple sculptures that he would have visited and seen during uh, his honeymoon. Or here in a similar way, woods, quite bold, uh, this var varying palette of, of browns uh, that he uh, shows us, the branches, the stems here of, uh, the, uh, the trees that he uh, just shims us without any foliage. Uh, whatsoever, but I think there's a very strong connection here that you can see, I think, with those wooden sculptures that you find uh, quite fascinating. He does here and there still relate to uh, Japanese traditions. Uh, if you look closely uh, in this whirlwind of, of shapes and, and colors here, the profile of an ancient warrior, you can see a top knot of a samurai. You can see uh, the sword of a samurai. So there are certain elements that uh, still connect to uh, Japanese traditional art. 
but in a completely new interpretation here in these abstract views uh, that uh, he preferred uh, in his version. As I said, he traveled, he was like his wife Shizuko, impacted by surrealist movements, by pop art, uh, by collage. And this is exactly what we then see within his work, not just creating his uh, pieces with the pure woodblock printing technique, but he brings in photo engraving, um, photo etching, lithography, combining that with traditional woodblock painting techniques. So he augmented really the techniques and experimented with this, which is absolutely fascinating. And you see here in this series uh, in the 70s, um, there's a, uh, a whole bunch of works that he titles mythology, Shinwa in, in Japanese, which have some really obscure, uh, very strange surrealist combinations of, of themes. But he was also traveling a lot. So a lot of the houses that you see in the background, he, he was a huge fan and uh, had a huge impact on him was his travels to, to Mexico. So a lot of the, the buildings that he incorporates in the background of these um, views were inspired by his trips to Mexico. He certainly experiments also with, with the famous Bokashi, the gradation, the shading that you see there at the top, how he creates uh, the sky. But then certainly surrealist moments uh, combining really some obscure um, figures in the day, but also in the night view, but how they also then kind of seem to, uh, to correspond. Uh, this is all I want to, to say about uh, these two views. But you see here most definitely a complete departure from anything that the uh, first generation had done. And here, most definitely, we see the impact of uh, pop art. Uh, he visited uh, New York many, many times, uh, here in particular in the one on uh, the left-hand side in the nonsense mythology. Uh, there are inspirations uh, from magazines. He was uh, interested in collage, uh, not just general magazines, particular erotic magazines. Um, that uh, he incorporated into uh, these designs, but that kind of forms uh, across here, as you see, the panels, the squares uh, in yellow, and then that are added then on either side uh, also in uh, red. Uh, or their mythology of sky, uh, simply uh, combination of a variety of elements that inspired him to create these uh, associations uh, with coins, uh, here, pocket watch, uh, figurative elements. There is a, he are really creating really absolute new views and these new interests that he had encountered in works uh, of Western artists. Uh, of various movements, whether it was surrealism, pop art, and so on. So really uh, embracing uh, these uh, new styles and uh, art forms. Let's move on to Shizuko. Like Fujio, her mother-in-law, she had already made a name for herself uh, as well as an artist before she married into uh, the Yoshida family. Uh, you see here uh, beautifully in her sitting in her uh, workshop on the left hand side. But I would like to make here the connection. She started off also as um, a painter, 
but she was very interested in music and dancing. She, she wanted to become uh, a belly dancer, but uh, she had an accident and uh, that ended her, her dreams of becoming a dancer. But on one hand, she produces these sites uh, of gardens that we have seen uh, in her brother-in-law's uh, oeuvre or Yoshida Hiroshi. This is uh, a, a fictitious garden there, the Visteria Garden, where he incorporated a variety of scenes from various gardens. But Shizuko, like uh, Toshi, like her brother-in-law, uh, she was also inspired by Ten Beauty Garden in uh, Kyoto. But you see here a further abstraction. She was like uh, Hodaka, like her husband, also mesmerized and fascinated by uh, abstract uh, works. And uh, she was in particular fascinated and were part of that avant-garde group of the Seki no Kai, a group that was led by the surrealist painter uh, uh, Kamutu Taro. And uh, they were part of that avant-garde group of writers and artists. And uh, that connection inspired her to move on uh, from these more nature-inspired themes, uh, creating these type of works, jazz and rain, uh, where you see her love for music. Uh, I mean, particular in rain, uh, those uh, black lines and dots uh, I mean, they almost look like musical notes that are jumping uh, around uh, those uh, graphic elements uh, in the background or here, uh, jazz. Uh, yeah, whether there might be also trumpets that she shows here, but certainly sort of that atmosphere that she might have uh, encountered in, in a jazz bar, uh, the, the atmosphere there, the music that inspired her uh, to yeah, still be able to dance, not professionally, but she was still uh, really a, a big fan of, of dancing. And uh, this love for dancing and love for music really shines through in a lot of her works, as we can see here, the movement. But also further abstraction uh, is certainly uh, another way that uh, she went down, partly also inspired. She, exhibited many times together uh, with her husband, Hodaka. Uh, I have not gone in into all the various art circles that right from the beginning, every member of the Yoshida family was part of. Uh, but uh, she was also part of the Shuyokai uh, that her mother-in-law had uh, founded. Uh, and she was also a founding member uh, of uh, uh, the um, Association of Female Printmakers in Japan, uh, with a set of five other female printmakers. So, like her mother-in-law, she was also one of those dominant forces for uh, female artists in Japan. Or experimenting with uh, blind printing, with embossing here. Uh, they took a trip to Australia and in her diaries, she often uh, reflects on how she was inspired by flying over the Great Barrier Reef and the beautiful uh, scenes that she had encountered uh, across uh, Australia as well. And so in, in this one here, this partly relates to that, but also, um, sorry, not this one here. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't include that, I'm afraid. Uh, but she most definitely uh, created these uh, yeah, new avenues, uh, sort of just incorporating really just a very small uh, patch here of uh, color and otherwise working with this completely um, blank sheet of paper um, with this beautiful blind em uh, embossing that, of course, uh, centuries of printmakers would have worked with as well. This is on the left hand side inspired by uh, scenes in uh, Hokkaido. On the right hand side, uh, this is the Printmakers Association in, uh, in Japan invited artists. Uh, for this series of 100 views of Tokyo 
quite connecting to the hundred years of Edo that Hiroshima produced in the 1860s during the Edo period. Uh, here, she was Shizuko was invited to participate in that series, the 100 Views of Tokyo Message to the 21st Century. And she chose a view from the Metropolitan Office, the Tocho in Shinjuku. And um, you know, she says that she uh, quite frequently went together there with Hodaka uh, to, um, to view the scenery of all uh, the skyscrapers uh, and quarters that are dotted uh, around that famous uh, building. I slowly but surely would like to come uh, to a close, but I also wanted to include another photograph here of her family, Hodaka and Shizuko. And uh, my next artist will be Ayobi, their daughter, who's uh, seated there on the right hand side next to her father. And you see here the, all the paraphernalia, uh, the, yeah the fascination that the whole family had about the travels to uh, Latin America. So Ayumi is the third generation, the final member that we will showcase in the exhibition. <laughs> I did interview her last year when uh, she came and uh, met her, which was uh, quite an honor. Uh, knowing that yeah, her grandfather is this icon of Japanese printmaking. Uh, she had actually not right from the start a huge interest. She, she did sketch, she uh, produced work, but like her parents, her uncle, well, maybe her uncle, yes, Toshi, because she, he took over the Yoshida workshop, but really none of the others were really pushed into becoming artists. And same here, she had a very strong interest in architecture, actually. Uh, she studied at Wako University uh, in Tokyo, uh, and she still lives and works in uh, Tokyo. But being a member of the Yoshida family, she was also then drawn into the work of printmaking. And this is what uh, she uh, produces here. Uh, the um, example on the right-hand side uh, she was invited to contribute to the same series uh, as her mom, the view from the Tosho. Here, Ayumi produces a view of the Kandagawa in Okashira, and this becomes really sort of uh, her forte. Uh, she is also very uh, interested in, in environmental uh, matters, and uh, that's why we often find um, scenes, abstracted scenes of uh, nature in her work. Oh, this was the one I wanted to show you earlier on by Shizuko, a sort of the view that was inspired by the view of the Great Barrier Reef. So that really being one of our themes in the exhibition, this continuity, the fascination with water, the reflections, uh, but then of course, in various types from a naturalistic view of Hiroshi to quite abstract views there in the oeuvre of Shizuko, uh, and her daughter, Ayumi. And when she visited the Dalich Picture Gallery last year, it was really a very emotional moment for her because she was born in 1958, so she had never the chance to meet Hiroshi, who died in 1950. And so we showed her uh, the visitor book and she touched the, uh, the signature of her uh, grandfather. And it was really quite a a movie moment for everyone who was uh, there. But for her installation, this is something that she thinks of creating uh, in the final gallery space. This installation inspired by cherry blossom. I know it will be summer, it's from June onwards, so we are slightly past the cherry blossom season. <laughs> but she had done research and she had found out that in Dunwich Village are Yoshino cherry trees, a type of cherry tree uh, that came to Kew Garden for the first time, I think around 1900, 1910. But there's also from the Japan Society and other institutions here in the UK, a project has been running for years of planting cherry trees across the UK. And part of that uh, project, that is why we have in Fern Hill and in Dulwich Village also 
cherry trees. And that inspired her uh, for the installation that will be partly woodblock uh, printed pieces, uh, but also uh, other materials that she will uh, incorporate. This is an installation she did uh, a few years back uh, in LA and in San Francisco. But it kind of brings us full circle uh, because this theme of cherry blossom, uh, of seasonality is really uh, visible throughout Japanese art and also throughout the three generations of uh, Yoshida uh, printmakers. And yeah, in particular, I think you know, the pieces that we have uh, within the exhibition here of the uh, first master of uh, Hiroshi uh, quite strongly uh, show this first master and his love for cherry blossom, but also then his granddaughter Ayumi doing this uh, fascinating installation then in the gallery space. So watch out for that. And I do thank you for your attention and I hope to see you again uh, at the gallery from John onwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a fascinating um, presentation. So beautiful. I think that's the most beautiful thing that we've seen this year. No offense, <laughs> um, but maybe I, I'll start this off. Um, we'll follow the classic academic format. Please uh, prepare your questions. If you're online, you can feed your questions into the Q&A function. Um, but I wanted to ask you, because you started out by saying so this is the Shin uh, Hanga and the Sosaku Hanga, and there's sort of two different ideas there. On one hand, uh, you have the full creative control over the whole process if you do the designing and the carving and the printing itself. But of course, that means you there's sort of an amateurish feel to it. And you mm -hmm. said at the beginning that you said you wanted to revise the the, the distribution of labor that that, that was what I'm So that right. was the publisher. Okay. That was the publisher he uh, first worked together with that he brought him to creating uh, prints. Right. And so he wanted to revive this exactly that quartet of yeah right. uh, that we had already during the, the Edo period of publisher, designer, um, carver and printmaker, exactly right. where each person has a separate job to, so to say. Yeah. Right, <laughs> which is a very modern sort of distribution of labor mm. type idea, mm. which maybe goes slightly against the idea of the artist as a sort of creator or mm. genius. And so the cheap lady, so the, I, I mm. did this myself, mm. would be sort of a, a remarkable thing this year. Uh, exactly, exactly. I mean, it was particular, I mean, even though Watanabe Shizaburo inspired Hiroshi to become a printmaker, so from that point onwards, he basically only produced prints. Right. But particular after the experience with the earthquake and having, yeah, I mean, of course, his workshop could have been destroyed as well with the earthquake, but he realized that having had the experience with Watanabe, um, you did have some impact depending on your status, mm -hmm. also during the other period as an artist, but the publisher was the one who, well, had the finances. He was at the helm of the publishing house, so he had the say. Right. So from that perspective, uh, it was liberating, I guess, for, for Hiroshi to say, this is not how I want mm -hmm. to work. I have these insights, I have these amazing craftsmen, these carvers and printers. But I, as the artist, have the say. Right. What is printed, how it is printed. So that is a complete shift. And um, it is a very interesting dynamic that we do have then from the early 20th century. So not all Sosako Hanga artists really did produce every single step. They also sometimes work together with carvers and printers. But the general idea was to really be like Hiroshi was, in charge of the process and have a say in the process. That was the crucial bit. Maybe not doing really each step yourself, but right. to, to be closely involved and engage with the craftsmen that worked uh, for him and the others uh, too. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Right. Questions from the floor? There's movement. There. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Thank you, Monica. I was just fascinated with lecture. I was just wondering, you were just following up on a um, question. I was wondering, have not only philosophers, but labour generation, did they have a division of or a distribution of labour, or they did, it, they did printing by themselves? And they how did that change to affect the studio or workshop? Um. We still have some carvers and uh, printers working there, but actually from the second generation onwards, usually the, the prints are referred to as Sosa Kuhanga prints. Uh, and we also have um, yeah, Toshia, but in particular Hodaka and Shizuko and Ayumi as well, uh, who were uh, involved with both processes of carving and uh, also printing. So uh, they are probably even more than Hiroshi and Toshi were even more involved and were proper Sosaku Nanda artists than um, the first two masters were Toshi and uh, Hiroshi. Yes, please. Thank you for the talk, Monica. It was really, really fascinating. And I was wondering about your special of work. Maybe it's a very simple question, but because of his interest in experimenting with light, I was wondering if there was some kind of connection with Impressionism. But I was wondering if there was or not, because we're already in the 1930s and Impressionism in Europe had already. So it's not a main movement. So. But because he was a, a yoga painter, yeah. a Western style painter beforehand, what yoga painters took as inspiration, it's not just the material of the canvas and oil or then watercolor, it was also particularly those who traveled abroad, many of those studied in Paris, was of course impressionism, plenarism, uh, changing of light, changing of um, yeah, daylight, night, uh, of of uh, weather conditions as well. I mean, we do have that in yeah, print as well. So I sometimes give lectures on Japanese, and I always actually argue that, for example, if you look at Monet's haystacks, the mm -hmm. serialization of that, showing a haystack at different times of day, yeah. where does that come from? I. Yeah. Also argue that that was already apparent in the woodblock prints that Mooney inspired and that he collected. So that might be an interesting argument or sort of spread to to, to follow uh, who experimented with that first. So, um, yeah, but it, but too. yeah, but there is certainly uh, already something that he had studied and experienced as a yoga painter before he became uh, a print uh, designer and artist that uh, had uh, yeah, certainly impacted him and particularly then also those various travels to, to America and also to uh, to Europe, uh, seeing Western art firsthand, of course, gave further inspiration and uh, impacted his work, most definitely. Yeah, thanks for listening. Yes, anyone over there? <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, that, fascinating. Thank you very much for the um, dynasty of the uh, printers. I was uh, very much uh, struck by the uh, uh, amount of traveling that they did the idea of the Hiroshi was very early, mm -hmm. especially in the US. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what was the um, reception mm -hmm. of this work. Mm -hmm. Right from the start, I mean, when they went in 1899 uh, for the first time, uh, that was actually through an invitation uh, of uh, Priya, St. Richard's Priya, uh, who then unfortunately uh, went off on a month long uh, trip, so we didn't actually uh, meet him. Uh, but um, that is one of the reasons why they set out or had also uh, heard from other yoga painters who had traveled to the States. And uh, their 
painting she was simply uh, hugely popular. I mean, right from the start, uh, Hiroshi um, did these exhibitions at museums in Boston, Detroit, Washington, and so these people. So, and that is one of uh, the reasons why his paintings, but also his his print and the whole Yoshida family, because every generation they traveled to the state, they did workshops. I didn't go into that at all today. Um, yeah, they they, they trained uh, print makers there. They also had uh, workshops and 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 Japan art centers there. So um, they were very active in promoting print making. Uh, and that is the reason why we have had so far the only special exhibition on that family in the States, because a lot of museums uh, have really great collections of the Yoshida family in their museums. And there are some here in Europe, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think that is one of the reasons because they were so focused, really, and very engaged with American collectors and uh, museums. That is why, yeah, they are. How did that start? Where did it start? Mm -hmm. American collectors. Um, and, 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 and was that any kind of a uh, uh, main person in that uh, uh, It was uh, basically, I mean, one museum that is really absolutely crucial for showcasing their work is the Toledo, Toledo Museum of Art and Dorothy Blair, who was a pivotal present. So she did the first two main exhibitions on him and generally on Japanese friends. And that catapulted their fame and uh, really enhanced the, the, the overall knowledge of and, and yeah, the Americans on their their over on their work. It, it, uh, yeah, that is uh, really sort of the, the certain connections that were uh, that were made during the initial uh, visits, but then most certainly uh, certain museums like the Toledo Museum of Art. I mean, these two catalogs are still yeah key works in uh, research about them uh, today. Or Shinhanga art. So this is really, uh, yeah. You you need these moments, <laughs> uh, often that then uh, really in, in, increase the, the the knowledge popularity uh, popularity um, of of these um, of artists. So yeah, he was lucky to have met these like Freya and uh, the people from the Toledo Museum to exhibit his work. And probably also a curiosity on the American side. They were simply mesmerized by his research. Thank you. There's several questions online here from uh, Peter McNamara, uh, for example. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. The profile of an ancient warrior had a color palette reminiscent of Haida art from Canada, Northwest America. Did that have been an influence on Bogata? Um, I haven't, yeah, come across um, um, the Canada connection uh, when I did research for uh, the the exhibition catalog. Um, but yeah, that is a very interesting aspect to to maybe keep in mind. I mean, both brothers because they were uh, kind of similar. Yeah, they took a lot of inspiration from their their travels and artworks that they. Uh, encounter. So, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to think back to get further. Thanks very much for the comments. Uh, I will let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have one more. So, more a uh, bit question Are all those pieces in the exhibition? And if not, where can we see them? Yeah, so most of the um, pieces that I showed in the um, in the presentation, uh, all those are basically that have uh, a black. Colored caption, yes. The white colored ones are not. Uh, I took these uh, in, which was very handy to be able to do that in, in a PowerPoint presentation during a talk today. So these uh, won't be in the exhibition, but yeah, those that you've seen with uh, the black uh, captions, they are. So as I said, we have, um, yeah, with the installation of uh, Ayumi. Uh, yeah, almost 80, 80 words presented in the show.
Thank you. There was another question from the room. Thank you very okay. much. Um, there's another one about influence. So I was wondering, did you mention this um, large flower sort of things? They reminded me a lot of so Georgia and Keith. Would she have been, would she have been in the place of her Was she, did she, do you know if there was an influence? Uh, it has been picked up. So the question is uh, the impact uh, or the similarity uh, of the um, Fujio's uh, flower uh, prints and the impact maybe uh, Georgia O'Keefe had on her work. It has been picked up by many uh, scholars beforehand, but the family said no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they they deny that there is an inspiration because she had dipped into the topic uh, before and had produced the oil paintings and uh, independently had yeah created these views of the enlarged flowers, but. Uh, I was waiting for the question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There's one more here and then over there. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I just have two quick questions. So, will we have any woodblock uh, in the exhibition? And the second question is uh, apart from Fukunoma Art Museum and private collections, what are the other sources that you've taken uh, uh, the prints from? Uh, okay. So, um, we will have in the so-called mausoleum space, which is in between those two wings of the, the gallery space, um, we will have a video and we will also have tools from the family and a woodblock. Yeah. Uh, so where you can actually see the yeah, type of chisels that they use, the, the barren, the uh, pad that they use to press the pigments into the paper from the woodblock. Um, we will be um, exhibiting uh, that. I'm not quite sure which video uh, we are going uh, with yet, uh, whether it's the video of Hiroshi uh, or not. I, I'm not quite sure, but there will definitely also be uh, a woodblock. And uh, one piece we also have uh, works from the Ashmolean Museum. Uh, there's a very famous series that I didn't touch on at all tonight uh, about uh, a junk from the Sitonal type. And he produced a succession of uh, prints where we see the different stages, how a color woodblock is being produced from yeah, the different stages and the different colors that are being used. So uh, that booklet, so to say, of these stages will be presented. So, uh, most of the prints are, as you said, from the Fukuoka Museum, the British Museum, and also the Ashmolean, and some from the uh, family. Uh, the other prints that I showed here, I think uh, quite a few are in the Minneapolis Museum of Art. Of course, the Toledo Museum of Art that I mentioned uh, has quite a few Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, there are, there are more, so, <laughs> but uh, these are, uh, I think, the ones, uh, and the Metropolitan Museum in New York has also some, some of that them. So, uh, if you're interested in that, I have a, a whole list of uh, uh, other collections that can meet. Uh, but uh, there's always a fabulous uh, website, ukiyoe.org, where you can, oh, yeah, 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 it's a search yeah. engine, uh, and that will produce, uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Variety of collections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for the wonderful presentation. <laughs> um, I have two questions. It's all about curating. Mm -hmm. um, first question is uh, when you select some of the paintings or prints, when you couldn't get it from other museums, do your topic as to the, the thing has to be compromised? Mm -hmm. And uh, the second question is uh, when you select the work, do you have to tailor? Or the oh, very interesting uh, question. The first one I very briefly mentioned at the beginning when I came in as a project curator uh, last March, they had already done the selection. So it was very easy for me. 
Uh, we actually had too many. It will be even now with those almost 80 works, quite a dense uh, exhibition. Um, for, for us, or uh, of the reason why the curators uh, there, um, uh, in particular, uh, Ken Hilliard and Jane Finkel, that I worked together with, uh, who have been of tremendous support, um, they really wanted to show these three generations and uh, had the, the vision to also then uh, end the exhibition with a piece of the current uh, generation. Um, I think the, the selection was already uh, great. I, I was still able to, to, to change and shift. Uh, there are here and there maybe kind of gaps in the oeuvre, maybe with Shizuko, she did some really quite beautiful uh, floral um, views as well. Um, quite similar maybe to, to what, or maybe it was an inspiration from her mother-in-law. Um, no, but generally uh, it was for me very easy to really already work with this great uh, selection that uh, the creators had uh, selected. Uh, had done, um, or had made brother, so which I think now I have made. Um, catering to the British audience. Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I think because you give, because there is no exhibition, no example here in the UK before, of course, I use exhibition catalogues from those previous American collections and also from uh, Japanese uh, special uh, shows that have taken place in the past. Um, for me, it was important to, to really show the, the history, to show the, the connections among those members. Uh, this continuity, the change that uh, took place, uh, it, it is really sort of an, an initial introduction of that family to a UK audience. And um, that is, yeah, I think quite, quite challenging because how far do I go back in explaining about the history of football print making, for example, or all these various societies uh, that I didn't touch on today, those strands of um, fairs and the government exhibitions also that uh, were happening in Japan uh, that they were involved with. So uh, th that is kind of a, a, a challenge. How far do you go back to uh, to address that? But um, on, on the other hand, it was then really nice for, for the catalogue yeah, to introduce each artist briefly and then write um, um, captions and explanations for, for some of the, the works and particular sort of those pairings you can, of course, then combine quite nicely. And uh, no, it is really sort of to, to give really an introduction to that uh, family. And I don't think I would have, coming from Germany, for example, I don't think I would have uh, addressed it and prepared it uh, in, a, in a different way for, for a German audience. I don't uh, think so. Uh, of course, it is nice now here with that starting point of Hiroshi's visit to Dulwich uh, with the signature in the visitor book. Um, what we won't be shown because we focus on, on prints, they did produce watercolors from their travels around the UK. Um, uh, Hiroshi and then later with Fuji as well, I think, um, and uh, with this fellow artist. So, uh, we do have some wonderful watercolors of scenes of Rory Castle, for example, that uh, then Ayumi visited uh, those sites last year. Uh, so, uh, of course, that would have been a, a different angle and might also be for future MA or PhD dissertations, maybe an interesting. Uh, Thing to to work on uh, maybe yeah that line sort of to uh, to showcase maybe there that strong connection with, with the UK Britain with England 
uh, in the water color. So um, I don't think I, yeah, I mean, there is a special connection here that we have with Hiroshi and visiting the, the gallery uh, and having traveled here. Uh, so that is, of course, then sort of pieces uh, that uh, I uh, explain. Uh, but apart from that, I don't think I, I would then have, yeah, immensely different for, uh, yeah, German or, yeah. No, we're a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Last question or two more questions. Two more questions, please. Just a short follow up as, as you were touching the topic of uh, audience. Will the labels and all the catalog be monolingual? Um, these are the other or the captions that I've used here are. The ones that I also prepared for uh, the catalog, and they go further. I haven't included that yet. So in the catalog, you see each detail. I mean, prints are so rich of information. Uh, the signatures, uh, the titles that they have given, what kind of titles are they in English or in uh, uh, Katakana? Um, so in in so all this information is is in the catalog, but generally the catalog is is in English. <laughs> but yeah, all the information that you draw from uh, a print, uh, they are also uh, within uh, the mm -hmm. well, Thank you. Final question. I think it was for your stimulating presentation. I learned a lot from you today. And uh, I, um, this is just my impression, but uh, uh, I learned, I, I got the impression in your presentation today that. Uh, uh, Yoshida family and made uh, lots of landscape printings and uh, some of the uh, abstract shapes, but not so much or no portrait mm -hmm. or things like that. Uh, I, may, I may be wrong, but uh, if so, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is the risk? No, it's not so much good question. No, yeah, you're quite right. I mean. I, I left out uh, one piece by, by Toshi, uh, which is called uh, Woman in Baghdad. And he also did, it's in that white line type of uh, technique without uh, a, a black uh, key block. Uh, he produced, yeah, I think a set of three figurative uh, prints. The reason I think is I would, explain it in that way, the, the dominance of the first master, Hiroshi, being that famous master of landscape prints. I think that is a certain continuity that shows in all generations, in all members of uh, the family. I mean, the strongest departure you can certainly see with Kodaka and, and, and Shizuko, but even in her print ante anticipation, yeah, there are some figurative elements that she played with. And, um, but generally, yeah, you're quite right. Landscape was certainly uh, the strongest inspiration for, for all of them. No, most of them. Landscape or nature. It's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. This brings us to the end of this evening. Not quite. Please join us in the senior common room um, where we will have wine and some crisps and so you can continue your questions. If you come from the outside of SOAS, please latch on to somebody who has a card. So security is very kind. And also remember, you won't be able to leave simply once we've got, we get you in the room. We don't let you go normally. But please ask somebody to help you out. The wines are, the red is Spanish. Uh, the white is a pool de fine. So um, please uh, do uh, join us upstairs, first floor in the senior common room. And do return next week when we have a panel discussions on Miyazaki Hayao's latest film, The Boy and the Heron, with uh, uh, Satana Suzuki, Filippo uh, Cervelli, uh, and myself. Thank you very much for coming. And <laughs>